Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Kyla Scanlon. Kyla is the author of the book, In This Economy, How Money and Markets Really Work. Kyla brings economics to a wide and often younger audience and is the founder of Bread, a financial education company. Kyla, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. We have a lot to talk about. Before we get into the economics topics, I want to talk about a connection that we have. We both are connected to Western Kentucky University. Go Hilltoppers. Go Hilltoppers. WKU. And I learned in preparing for the show that our paths just barely missed. We were there for a year at the same time, but you weren't an econ major. I was an econ professor. So tell us about your WKU story. Oh, this is great. Yeah, I was a presidential scholar, I think. And so I had a full ride and ended up getting a stipend to go to school, which was like unbelievable because I was really worried about student loan debt. And so that was great. And then I went into school thinking that I was going to be an engineering major. I didn't realize that econ and finance was something that you could study. And once I took Brian Strauss' class, Econ 203, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so I switched my majors over to the business school and just had a really great time. Like the professors were so supportive. I started a club there. I was an athlete there. It was just everything that I wanted to try. Everybody kind of let me. I had a lot of free reign and I just did everything I could on, on campus. It was a phenomenal experience. Yeah, so some folks may not know that you're a D1 track and athlete star. <laughs> retired. Uh, retired, okay. <laughs> yeah. But you were competing at that yeah, level, yeah, both athletics and then you did econ. You were a triple major, I understand. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, econ, finance, and data analytics. Okay, so what was your favorite course when you were there at WKU or maybe top few courses? Mm-hmm. I really loved game theory. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, Dr. Suzanne Leguizamon taught it. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun because I just, it sort of tied together what I was interested in, which was like the behavioral psychology. But then how do you sort of quantify behavioral economics and psychology? So I really enjoyed game theory. And then there was a class, which was just one credit hour that Dr. Chachi in the finance department taught. And it was called the TVA investments class. And so you were able to manage a $500,000 portfolio, you know, pitch stocks to a group of students. You had to be selected to get into the class. And that was so fun because I, I love stocks and companies. Just learning about companies, I'm a terrible investor, so I just do ETFs. But that was a really enjoyable experience as well. Now, I reached out to Dr. Lebedensky, or Alex as I call him, <laughs> and he wrote this about you. So I'm going to read this. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to brag on you as, oh. as a former professor there and you're a graduate of it. This is what he had to say about your time there. So I remember my first conversation with her very well. She was a student in my financial data modeling class and wanted to do extra work for the class so that she could earn honors credit for it. I suggested various topics she could work on and went on this long tirade about stock options, explaining to her what calls and puts were starting from the basics. Kayla listened politely without interrupting my very long spiel. But when I finally paused to ask if what I said was making sense, she told me she'd been trading options in high school. That's when I realized she was on a completely different level than most students. <laughs> Do you remember that moment? I, I remember. He's been so supportive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, he's a great explainer. So I, I just was curious to listen. <laughs> yeah. Then he goes on to say more. Oh. She is one of the most outstanding students I've ever had in my 20 years in academia. She earned three majors, econ, finance, and data analytics, and was chosen as an Ogden, is it Ogden? Yeah. Ogden Scholar, our equivalent of val- valedictorian for the entire university. She was an outstanding senior in all her majors, racked up a number of awards. During the recognition ceremony when she was called to the stage to receive her awards, every introduction sounded different because her list of accomplishments was enough for about five outstanding students. Wow. <laughs> okay, finally, <laughs> I am thrilled that Kyla had the courage and drive to pursue her passion instead of following a traditional career path. So he was excited to see you go and, and start this business, be entrepreneurial. Yeah. 
So how did that happen? How did you go from WKU into the place you are now? Yeah. So I wanted to do a PhD. And I remember talking to Dr. Lebedinsky and Dr. Tachi about that because I wanted to teach. I loved tutoring and mm-hmm. I just loved talking about econ. And Dr. Tachi was like, you should probably go into industry and just see. Just see if you like it. You can always get a PhD later. And so I was like, okay, sure. And I graduate in 2019. And uh, I moved to Los Angeles in June of 2019. And six months later, the pandemic happens. I was at Capital Group on the buy side, did you know equity portfolio research, was on their macro team for a little bit, it was in a rotational program. And so the pandemic happens. And I was like, oh, oh no, <laughs> you know, what's going on? And like things could end. And so for me, there was a big awakening where I was like, what do I want to spend my time doing? And I really enjoyed all the learning opportunities at Capital Group and really enjoyed, you know, talking to people. I got in through blind resume. So it was like a really awesome opportunity. But I wanted to see what I could do by myself. I'd always struggled with a creative ceiling at Capital Group because when you're an associate, like, you can't really have ideas. (laughs) I didn't understand that at first. And then I was like, oh, okay. And so during the pandemic, I was like, well, I have all this time. I'm all alone in Los Angeles in my 300 square foot apartment. And I I left the company and started making videos about GameStop and then just decided to transfer all of my economic knowledge and what I was learning from others to social media. And it wasn't new for me to do something like this. I had a blog in college called Scanlon on Stocks, where I talked about options trading. So it was just something I'd always sort of done in the background, and I just wanted to refocus on it. And I've been so lucky and so grateful that so many people have believed in me along the way. So you just quit your job and you started posting. I mean, did you have savings? I mean, were you leap of faith here? What was? Going oh, on? it was so scary. Yeah, yeah, there was like if I failed, it was over. <laughs> like I had nowhere to go. Yeah. Oh my, suppose, but it, it was very terrifying. And so, yeah, it was it was partially a leap of faith. I, I was at a startup for a little bit called On Deck, building out their investment education program. Mm-hmm. So I had that as like sort of a safety net. Okay. And then like every time I wasn't working on the startup, I would go and, and work on my own videos. And I left that company when the video started to gain traction. I when I first started, I did skits. So I like pretended to be Jerome Powell. I think I remember yeah. this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I haven't done one in a while, but that's how I got my start. And then I was able to secure like a brand deal with a crypto company called Bankless, making videos for them. And that was enough to live on. And so I was like, okay, I'll just do that on the side and then just focus on, you know, mm-hmm. producing daily economic videos. And it's almost, it'll be three years in October since I that's left. That's amazing. Yeah. Living the American dream, huh? Yeah, entrepreneur. <laughs> (laughs) That's great. That's great. So let's talk through all the different things you're doing. So you have a podcast, you have a newsletter, you have multiple channels and social media. I mean, is is YouTube your main one or TikTok Mm -hmm. or? I would say Instagram Reels. Oh, Instagram. Yeah, that's a big one, which I know you want to learn about. Yes, yes. (laughs) TikTok is TikTok. It's a good platform, but it's definitely a different user base than Instagram. Twitter, LinkedIn, I have a Substack, a YouTube, and a podcast. So I, I produce a lot across a lot of different channels. And then I also partner with Bloomberg Opinion with like the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And so I, I work with a lot of companies and then also have like the bread, which is the name of my company. Yeah. I have that side of things too. So what's it like the, an average day in your life? And you get up, you have all these different platforms you gotta post to, videos you gotta make, news you gotta read. How do you do it? Oh, I mean, I I think like anybody else, you know, I I wake up pretty early. I'm an early bird Mm -hmm. and I like to read the news first thing in the morning, which sometimes sets my day off in a weird direction. So I read the news and then I I usually try to have a workout and then I'll kind of like process what I'm thinking about during a workout. I find that movement helps me think. So I ride my bike or I go to the gym or I do a yoga class. And then I usually have meetings. (laughs) I'm in a lot of meetings And then I will produce my video around 3 p.m. And then in the nighttime, I'd write. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you you make these videos, I mean, how do you find the inspiration, the material? Is it a hot topic of the day? Mm -hmm. Something you've thought about during your yoga, your exercise, (laughs) reading the news? I mean, how do you pick your topics? Yeah. So like for the daily videos, I'm usually news responsive. So I'll talk about like rent caps, which came out yesterday or this morning, I suppose. But the news came out yesterday. The the actual press came out this morning as time of recording. 
for the longer stuff, like my Substack, I'll do various interviews and sort of tell a broader story. Like I'll do an interview with the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adeyemo, about the housing crisis and talk about the policies that are being implemented to fix housing crisis. But then I'll sort of build a story around what he's saying. So I'll explain the housing okay. crisis. So the Substack and the podcast and the YouTube are a little bit more in depth and take up more time and are not as news responsive as the daily short forms. So I know you don't like the term social influencer, <laughs> but what does it take to do all that? I mean, how much time do you put in a typical day to post the videos, to post your podcast, all that? Like how, how many hours a day do I Yeah, work? I mean, is, is, it, is it like, you know, 80 hour a week to become the kind of reach you have? I don't know. I mean, like a, a job like this, you never really stop working. Like, mm-hmm. you're, And I'm sure it's the same for you. Like you can just consume right, news right, and research right. all day long. And is that working? I don't know. But I, I would say that, yeah, like upfront, the time investment is high. It has to be. You just yeah. have to learn how to make videos. You have to be responsive on the platforms. Right now, I'm traveling quite a bit for the book and then just for interviewing people, which is just phenomenal. It's such an honor. So, yeah, but I, I don't know what else I'd want to do with my time other than like be on my bike. <laughs> so. so you love what you do. So when you wake up, you're like, let's go. Let's do this. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, awesome. such a, it's an honor. You know. Yeah. So in fact, today you were here in D.C. visiting mm-hmm. The NABE conference presenting there. You mentioned you visit the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. So t- tell us about that, b- being on the circuit, going around, promoting your book. <laughs> well, the NABE conference was kind of about the book, but they brought me and Joey Politano, who I think you've mm-hmm. had on the oh, podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we were on stage together, and he's one of my best friends, so that was okay. really fun. How did you guys meet? Through, Through the internet. Yes? Yeah, okay. yeah. So I was one of the people who was like, Joey, start your Substack. Like, you're, you're so good. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah wow. he's great. And like, going back to your point about like, how do you sort of take the leap when it's so mm-hmm. uncertain? And that that's hard. And, and so we talked a lot about that, like what that looked like, me and Joey. And so, yeah, but we were on stage together talking about like, how do you discuss economic data on social media? How do you communicate these like rather hairy ideas to a broad audience? Like one thing I love about your podcast is it's so dense and your guests are so technical and it's so good. But like, how do you take these like really good ideas that people have? And this is what you do as well and like translate that. And so that's what we were on stage talking about. And then the interviews with the Council of Economic Advisors and the National Economic Council were about housing policy. Because one thing that's really tough right now is that there's a lot of policy being passed, but it's, you know, a translation issue. People don't know that it's happening. Like, they don't know that there's been $35 billion allocated to convert commercial into residential. They don't know that there's going to be 2 million more units built based on the low income housing tax credit. What I what I try to do is, you know, take these policy ideas, communicate them to a, a wider audience and just let people know that the problems that they're facing are being worked on. Well that's great. I've had people tell me, my family members, they can't understand my podcast. So <laughs> even though I might make it accessible I, I to a, a, a certain audience, yeah. there is a much wider audience that you do reach, make these things accessible. But when yeah. you're talking about Fed balance sheet or you're talking about currency swap lines, or a nominal GDP target versus a price <laughs> level target. There's only so much. I know my parents listen because they're my parents. That's but, <laughs> but some people are like, yeah. David, I tried. But that that's okay. People like you and, and other people who care about this stuff, I, I know, listen. So let's go back to your book, because you mentioned your book. This book is the basis of your tour. How did that come about? Oh, the book? So I... I coined this term back in July 2022, the Vibe Session. Yes. And it took a life of its own, which was like kind of wild. But I wrote this New York Times opinion piece about it. And so Penguin Random House reached out to me and they were like, have you ever thought about writing a book? And so for me, I'm a huge book nerd. I love reading. And I was writing books when I was like eight years old about penguins. And so I I was like, of course, I thought about writing a book. And so that was like a very big personal achievement. But then I really wanted to communicate these ideas in a book format because all of my content is on social media. And you're kind of a part of people's algorithm at that point. It's not static. Like they can scroll away at any moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's much easier to scroll away and and consume a video that isn't about, you know, nominal GDP targeting (laughs) and is about something just easier to to deal with mentally. And so I wanted to have a, a sort of foundational sandbox that people could go and sort of consume these economic topics. And then, yeah, just a place for people to go that was outside of social media. So, Kyla, we have been discussing all the work that you're doing across the many social media platforms, at conferences, 
with your book, and it's amazing all that you're doing. And the success seems driven in part by your curiosity and the desire to better understand the world. You also are a great interviewer yourself, as seen on your podcast. So between your curiosity and your natural podcast hosting abilities, I suspect you may be chomping at the bit to flip the roles here and host Macro Musings for a few minutes so you can ask me some questions. Yes, absolutely I do. (laughs) Okay, let's do this. Ask away. I mean, I'd love to hear more about nominal GDP targeting. This this mug is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, especially with like recent policy moves and what Absolutely. could happen this year. Yeah. So for those who aren't seeing the video, we have two nominal GDP targeting mugs. These are classic. People <laughs> have asked me many times for these, and, and Kyla's getting her own. It's so exciting. Yes. So we have that to share with her. So I, I guess I can give the elevator pitch, and I can give maybe a little bit longer version. But the yeah. elevator pitch is... Have the Fed focus on total dollar spending as opposed to prices. Mm-hmm. And depending on who you're speaking to, you could you could say total dollar income. So if you're speaking to like an industry group, we want to stabilize sales in the aggregate. To a labor group, we're trying to stabilize incomes. And that's the elevator pitch. Now, if you stabilize those over a long period of time, you ultimately stabilize the price level too because it's a, it's a nominal measure. So that's the quick elevator pitch. We're trying to stabilize the growth of the dollar size of the economy, whether we measure it from the income side or the the sales side. The the longer pitch, and this would answer your question about how do we think about it in recent policy, would be it's a tool that makes it easier for the Fed to work through supply shocks, for for starters, number one. So if you're focusing on just demand and a supply shock comes along, you don't worry about inflation. In fact, one of the, I think, the features, the beauties of nominal GDP targeting you're just stabilizing the total dollar path. And so if inflation goes up temporarily, that's okay. Now, long-term trends, you might worry about that. So during the pandemic, for example, the, if the Fed had been following a nominal GDP target, they would have looked at probably forecasted path of where nominal GDP was going, as opposed to trying to figure out, is this transitory or not? And I think that's the challenge. In real time, how do you know if inflation is temporary driven by supply shocks or maybe fiscal policy checks. We don't know. And and nominal GDP targeting says, don't try to know. Just focus on total dollar size and, and grow it. So that's that's kind of a, another angle. There, there's other ones during the 2010s. People like Michael Woodford was promoting it as a way to get out the, the uh, zero lower bound. So it's, it's a level target, which you could do this with the price level target too, but make up policy. And more recently, there's been a financial stability argument for it, that if you keep nominal incomes, you keep salaries on their expected path, people can meet their mortgage payments, and it preserves the financial system from cascading. So that's kind of the quick version of it. Well, so what's the pushback against this idea? Is it just like, oh, we can't shift the path from what we're doing now? Or like, why would this not be implemented? That's part of it. In fact, in 2011, they had the discussion. 2012, they first introduced the official inflation target. And I was just looking at the transcripts from 2011. They were discussing a number of options, including nominal GDP targeting. Mm. And Bernanke goes, yeah, this would not be a great time to suddenly go something dramatically, so it seems foreign. But if put that to the side, I think the big reservation you have probably for most people would be the data issue. So GDP comes Mm -hmm. out quarterly, and then there's big revisions to it. And this is why I would prefer like forecast, look at a forecast of nominal GDP. So for example, make this concrete, if you look at a forecast of nominal GDP in 2021, you would have seen that it was going to the dollar size was really going to really really overheat, get much larger than a, a stable growth path would have suggested. So you would do something like that. So I think there's ways around it. The other thing I would note: if the Fed were to adopt a nominal GDP target, I think the data would be endogenous. They would find the data if, if they really wanted to yeah. do it. So that, that I think you can put that one to bed. The other one, and I've had I had Chair Powell tell this to my face. <laughs> he said. His exact words were, David, I'm trying really hard to fall in love with nominal GDP targeting. I said, well, how can I get you past, you know, the the end zone, into the end zone? And and he said, the communication. He goes, how do I communicate this to people? Yeah, it's complex. Well, I would never say, tell the public, we're doing nominal GDP level targeting. That that is a mouthful. I, I agree. I would go back to what I mentioned earlier. I would say we're targeting, like, the dollar size, we're targeting the average income in America, the dollar growth of your income. And sometimes that's a lot easier, actually, than saying we're targeting inflation. So as an example, 
I believe it was QE2 and, and Bernanke was before Congress. They asked, why are you doing more QE? Why more large-scale asset purchases? And he said, I'm trying to raise the inflation rate. And they flipped out. Yeah. What are you telling me? We're in a weak economy. You want to raise things more costly. And what he really meant is I'm trying to raise aggregate demand, yeah. the dollar level. And that's and I say, just cut to the chase. Say, hey, I'm trying to get the dollar size of the economy up, which means higher incomes, higher sales. Yeah. So in some contexts, I think it's actually easier. But it, look, if we were committed to it, I think there's, there's a path forward through communication. But data and communication, I think, are probably the two biggest issues. Yeah. But if you're targeting incomes like that, how would you design policy around that? Like, how would you... Oh, actually implement it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could do a a Taylor Rule version of it. Mm -hmm. So I actually have some papers. And and to be clear, I'm not the first person to bring this up. But there's been work done. In fact, going back to the 1980s, Greg Mankiw and Robert Hall had a paper. Now, they looked at, like, using monetary aggregates and control those. But I would say simple interest rate rule. Look at a target nominal GDP path versus what actually it is and... And you can go with that. So you, you have to come up with a measure. The, the, here's the hard part, I think. Come up with a measure of where you think the optimal or neutral nominal GD path is. Mm-hmm. I have my measure. We have at Mercatus. But others have other ones. Athanasia Ophrenides has a similar approach. So it's it's there are rules out there. But I think the data issue communication really is is a, is tough. But here's what's interesting. There's been a lot of discussion recently on, on this Fed framework, which we're going to hopefully start soon. They, they review every five years their framework. And they had a session at Brookings recently, a, a conference. They won at Stanford at Hoover. And everything that was brought up is something nominal GDP targeting could fix. They're like, we need more symmetry, less asymmetry, because fate, you know, it makes up inflation from below, but not from mm-hmm. above. A number of people were hung up about the asymmetric approach to maximum employment in the framework, you know, shortfalls versus deviations. Mm-hmm. Nominal GDP targeting is a way to have, you know, above or below, you you hit that target. And again, the beauty of, to me, of the past few years of nominal GDP targeting would have been we wouldn't tighten in the, in the presence of a supply shock. Just because inflation is going up, you don't have to tighten if nominal demand. And clearly, you know, 2020, the real GDP collapses prices begin to go up in 2021, you're okay with it as long as nominal GDP is, is on a stable path. And how long is that path planned out for? Like, if how big would the like, no, timeline have to be? Well, that's a good question. So you, depending on who you ask, <laughs> different views, one would be you need a dynamic update of that, of that path as potential real GDP changes. So then the critique is, well, how do you know what potential real GDP <laughs> is, right? <laughs> Athanasius Orphanides has, has done a lot of good work on this. He shows that the forecast error for potential real GDP is much lower than for like R star, U star, e- even the output gap. The output gap, which isn't a Taylor rule, you need to know real GDP precisely and potential real GDP. So you do need to have an update of potential real GDP. I argue that potential real GDP usually doesn't change dramatically overnight unless – something really crazy where to have a war or something. Yeah. But, so you can you can forecast it. I would say go with consensus forecast. Where they survey professional forecasters, they have like a five, 10-year forecast. Kind of go with where the market, where consensus has it. And then you would gradually update that and add 2%. And that would be your nominal GDP target. Hmm. So you would have, just to reiterate, you would have stable inflation over the medium run with that. You might in the short run have high inflation, low inflation. Hmm. And that sounds politically like a tough thing to get through? Would that be? It would. I mean, I, I think because it's so different, it might be, be a tough sell. However, it meets the dual mandate. It has both the real yeah. side and, and inflation in it. We've talked to a lot of Republicans see, who seem sympathetic to it. I think there's some Democrats who are sympathetic to it as well. So, Do their sympathies lie in, oh, it probably does make sense, like not target inflation, but to instead to target income? Some of them, though, the Democrat progressives more so on that point, yes. But, you know, I, I think the Republicans, you, you often will hear, well, this is a version of money supply targeting, which you would say it's velocity-adjusted money supply target, M times V. That's what nominal GDP is. So you can appeal to that. So it, there's different ways to sell it. I, I'm sounding very political here on this, but but you got to market what it is. And, yeah. and I think I think it's robust. And, I, and the thing is, what I would say is it – 
it avoids deep downturns in the economy, avoid depressions, mm -hmm. but it also avoids big overshoots. That's, that's the thing. We want to avoid both extremes. We learn painfully yeah. that people really don't like inflation. And some of that we may not be able to prevent. A supply shock is something that mm -hmm. there's really not much we can do in the short run. Yeah. about it and where did this come about for you like when were you like oh yes this is like something oh, good that question. we should oh boy okay the roles are flipped here <laughs> okay <laughs> so i was a graduate student in the late 90s tell you how old i am it's 1999 i was just started my phd program and george selgin i don't know if you're familiar with him he actually was an advocate of nominal gdp targeting back then wow. but for a different reason and his story is if you have a massive productivity boom. So in the late 90s, the first tech bubble, there's talk of you know, productivity gain, similar to, to right now. What do you do? Do you allow disinflation? I mean, what's the best approach? Mm -hmm. Do you try to offset it? And the concern is if productivity is going way up, then maybe R star or the equilibrium rate is going up as well. But if you lower rates to offset the disinflation, maybe you create an asset bubble. There's all these trade-offs. And he argued nominal GDP targeting is the easy way out. You just you keep you know nominal income, you keep wages stable, let the price level adjust if it needs to a little bit down. He would argue for benign deflation. So that was his in fact he has a book, it's really good called Less Than Zero. I recommend it to listeners. It's really accessible books. That was my first introduction. How do you handle a period of really strong, robust growth? As opposed to most of the discussions we've had about nominal GDP targeting were after the Great Recession. How do you handle weak growth? Again, I think it's good for, for both sides of the, of the problem. Mm -hmm. How long have you spent just working on this? Have, has it been since grad school to like refine the proposals? Uh, I've worked on some other issues, but probably I started working on it the most intensely during the Great Recession. So I started yeah. blogging around late 2007, 2008. I was actually thinking in late 2008 – it's like, man, Fed policy is actually looking a little tight. Hmm. I was really getting worried that we're going off a cliff and nominal GDP targeting was to me one, one way to cross-check ourselves. And let me, let me go back to the, the policy transition. You wouldn't have to necessarily go to a nominal GDP target immediately. What you could simply do is cross-check yourself, like where are forecasts for nominal GDP going? So something as simple as that would have helped in 21, 22 and presumably would have helped in 2008. Yeah, because I think a lot of the criticisms of the Fed have been that the toolkit is limited. Would you agree? Yeah. 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 Now there's also politics they have to contend with, you know, to be fair. And and also, you know, I, I think over the long run, the Fed does determine the price level and the path of total dollar size. But clearly in the near, medium term, the fiscal policy plays a role too. I mean, the yeah. stimulus checks, those things are important. The Fed can try to step in and offset that. Yeah. So we, we do need to be, I think, mindful of all the stimulus and support coming from, from government. Jerome Powell, he basically spoke out against that. I think at his last testimony, he was like, the fiscal deficit is too high. I think we also need to be mindful that there is an appetite. There was an appetite for safe assets, for treasuries. What's going to happen when we get to the other side of, you know, Fed's tightened policy? Is, mm -hmm. are, are rates high simply because we, we're coming out of the pandemic and the high inflation and all that's going to settle down? Or are they permanently higher is, I guess, another question. But that, that is part of the, the story here is what happens going forward. Do you think that they can be permanently higher? Like, do you think we can maintain? Uh, they're probably going to cut soon, right? Yeah, it looks but, like it. It certainly looks like it. And, and I think probably so. And I guess my question would be, how far can they cut? Yeah. Look, if if rates are permanently higher because we're permanently more productive, because AI, because the, the pandemic in some way made us more efficient, you know, the, the spending stimulus, all those things, I would be I, I would be happy to live in a world with slightly higher rates, but we're also growing rapidly. Economic growth is a cure to so many problems. So. That might be the case. I don't think, you know, if they can't permanently lower rates below what's a sustainable amount without blowing things up. Right, yeah. So. And how do you think about, like, the delicacy of that? Like, that's one thing that I've always struggled with. It's like, it's so delicate, you know, like lowering. How do you know where, how far? Yeah, and I guess there's, like, math to that. There's, there's, and, well, I, I think the practical side is we don't know. Like, yeah. how low can you go? Who knows? But 
I think the best thing we have are asset prices. So mm-hmm. look at break-even inflation. Look at forecasts for nominal GDP, which again, not ideal because they're consensus and stuff. My former colleague, Scott Sumner, I don't know if you remember him, he really advocated for a nominal GDP futures contract hmm. where the market would price in based on Fed policy, fiscal policy, where do they think that's oh, going? Yeah. And that would be an even better gauge. Now, there's issues people brought up with it, but... I think asset prices are probably the best clue we have to how low or how high we can yeah, go yeah. at this point. Yeah, that makes sense. And like when you look at asset prices right now, you know the stock market is now rotating into small caps, and it's but it's still going up. And yeah. like I guess you know number one, are you talking about stocks specifically? And then number two, like do you think they're pricing in something concerning? I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> I'll turn that over to you. you. You probably understand the market better than I, I do. Probably not. So, I don't but know that, if that's actually, does. you know what? That's a great question for maybe a segue into part of your book. I would like to chat with you about now. If we can flip the mics yeah. back around. <laughs> um, so, in your book, and actually, you mentioned it already. You're well known for the vibe economy. Yeah. And the vibe session that we arguably went through. I don't know, are we still going through a vibe session? Or is that that's behind us? People ask me that. And well now it's tough. And this is something I wanted your thoughts on too. It's like the data is making it difficult. So like you mish switched from phone calls to web based surveys. Yeah. And so now you have people being like, Yeah, I think inflation is gonna hit fifteen percent. And so it's just totally skewing consumer mm. sentiment metrics. So we're kind of like back in a vibe session, but it's because of data That's interesting. messiness. So. so you think if we had better data, then we would actually know more and better read of what's actually happening. Oh, yeah. And I also think that right, there's a gap between what people are saying and what they're doing. Like it, retail sales came in today at time of recording. They were strong. Mm-hmm. People are spending money. You know, TSA had the highest day of travel on July 4th, I think, ever. So people are out there spending money. Whether or not they're happy about it, maybe okay. not, but they're doing it. And so that's kind of where a weird discrepancy is also happening. It's like at a data level, it's confusing. And then at a consumer action level, it's confusing. <laughs> We are very confused people yeah. in America. Well, let me throw out the stories I've heard for this. So one is it's levels versus growth rates, mm-hmm. price level versus yeah. inflation, which I, I can see that if it's a sudden groceries are permanently higher and we're still getting used to it. So maybe mm-hmm. how long can that story go on? I, I don't know, but that would be one story. Another story, you probably saw the Larry Summers paper where he argued if you include interest financing costs into a CPI yeah. measure – then some of that gap between the hard econ data, like sentiment and data, they, they, it closes. But that's not a typical CPI measure. And the other one Paul Krugman gives, and I actually think there's something to this, but I want to see what you think. It's just we're more politicized. We live in silos. We, you know, if, if you go back and look at those polls, maybe you've looked at this better than I have, like consumer sentiment polls right around 2000, right about the time where like Fox News and it's easier to find your tribe comes out. We see swings between who gets elected where you didn't see that as much before. I mean, what do you do? You think any of those hold weight? Yeah, I mean, I think like the way that I talk about it is there's definitely an element of polarization. Like that's n- n- no joke. We don't seem to like each other as much as we used to, and I think a lot of that ties into like media headlines. Like there's mm-hmm. just a business model of clicks that exacerbates people's fear, and they want to 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 scare you because then you'll click. And so that's just the business model. And you can see that in sentiment charts of headlines, like it's trended negative for a long time. What I try to always caveat the vibes discussion with is like we do have structural affordability problems. We have a housing crisis, Mm -hmm. elder care is through the roof, child care is extremely expensive. Like there are real reasons that aren't captured in the metrics as to why people would feel bad. Like they can be out there spending money, but like be unhappy about it. And then it's like, well, you know, I do have to, you know, allocate this money towards rent and I do have to allocate it towards childcare and I do have to do all these things economically I'm okay but like ouch and so I think that's a big part of it too is that people do have like real economic pain I I think the tough part of the vibe session conversation is the discrepancy is so large like people feel so bad that if we do enter a recession um like what will happen I think that's kind of like what I yeah worry about Mm -hmm. so that could make the climate even more tense if we're at this level and things are good. Presumably. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Or it'll flip, you know. (laughs) Okay, maybe we need a slap in the face (laughs) to go the other direction. 
Wow, that's a very sobering thought as we head into a election yeah, uh, well, time, a season of our life. So yeah, I think the polarization is is a big point of it too. Like I think the average person is quite tired, and, and you know, what do you do about that? I'm not sure. Well, you answered a question I was going to ask you, and that is, how far does the vibe economy take you versus hard physical constraints yeah. on the ground? And you mentioned housing. So if you weren't fortunate enough to refinance or lock in a mortgage in 2021 like I did. Nice. <laughs> I mean, people, you're right. I mean, rent is high. Getting a new home is high. My dad was, was a realtor in retirement, and his sales, have, they've, they've bottomed out, right, both because there's a shortage of housing and because finance is so incredibly expensive. Yeah. So that, that would be infuriating if you're you know trying to find a home for the first time or maybe even a second or third time. I mean, yeah. What do you do? So yeah, you you, don't, you can't do anything, and I think like that feeling of helplessness is is tough. Like anecdotally, that's what I get from the people mm-hmm. who leave comments on my videos. It's like, you know, the American dream is a house, and I feel like I've been robbed of my future. Like I'm a renter, and I and I'm like I don't know if I'll ever own a home. <laughs> like it, it just doesn't seem feasible, and and that's tough because like the main way that we build wealth in the U.S. is through yep. home ownership, and for middle America, that's like what they know. And whether or not that's good is uh, perhaps a value judgment. I think that we should talk more about baby bonds and like how do we get people into the stock market? How do we think about small mm. business ownership, which is on the rise? But I, I think it's like a conversation ab- about wealth building. And the traditional way of building wealth isn't working anymore. And maybe it shouldn't. Like, should a house be both a speculative asset and a place that you live? Probably not. And so it's value judgment. But I think that there's like a bigger conversation that has to happen in conjunction with the housing crisis versus just like, okay, build more. And we'll just assume that everybody's houses will double in two years, you know? That's interesting. So the question you raise is, should our homes be our biggest investment? Because- it is a speculative asset at, at some level, and that creates the incentive for me to push back against you building a small Nimby. house next. Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> so, and that's, I guess, that's a, another question I have is as you communicate to this wide audience, whether the older or younger generation, there is this disconnect, I think, for many people. The, call them NIMBYs, but many of them are unconsciously maybe NIMBYs, you know. Like, I don't want multifamily housing going up down the street from my home, or I don't want that small starter home in my neighborhood. I mean, do you see this this dissonance between what people want? They may be very progressive in their social values, but they don't want a small home built near them. I know. Yeah, it's definitely a thing. And when I talk about the housing market, I, I get messages about that too, where it's like, well, I just built a home. Like, I don't want a, a high rise right next to me. And so I think for a lot of people, like, they are progressive, but housing gets really hairy because it's where you live. And we are very individualistic here in the U.S. and Mm -hmm. people really like their space. And so parts of it make sense, but then I I do think there has to be an acknowledgement that where you live, more people probably should be able to live there. Like we have to have dense end fill in cities and zoning reform is probably necessary if you want your city to thrive in the future. Constraining supply is like the best way to kill a city. We're seeing that with San Francisco right now. And so I think for people, like it's just something to think about I I think there's room for that conversation about like where should they be built but I think you know it's funny you look to the past and wealthy people were able to build ADUs accessory dwelling units in their backyard and so you usually had somebody like on your property living there but now that's not as popular we've kind Mm -hmm. of really (laughs) embraced a suburban lifestyle of you know a yard and a house and yeah. there's room for that, but there also needs to be building within cities. So let me push that a little bit more. It's interesting. So you <laughs> think another path forward might be good? I mean, how we need to work with what we have housing and promote more supply. But you, your point that that may not be the optimal path forward permanently because it is an ass, it's an investment as well as a place of residence. So what would be your path forward to get the average American? wealthy. I guess like I think we need to build more housing. Like that there's no question. Sure. It's too expensive. It's eating into people's income and I think the housing theory of everything is is a true idea where if you're feeling bad about your housing situation, you're probably feeling bad about economic circumstances mm-hmm. and the economy as a whole because it's, you know, gas prices and housing. That's what people yeah, grocery yeah. prices too. And I, I think that in order to think about r- building wealth, housing 
has been the way to, to build wealth. And right now we have the greatest wealth transfer in history potentially about to happen where a lot of boomers will pass on their homes to their millennial children. And so you were somebody who got in at the market at 2%. So there's a bifurcation between you and a person like me who <laughs> was not in the housing market at that time. But there's also going to be a bifurcation between the millennials who inherit homes from their boomer parents and those that don't. And John Byrne Murdoch over at the FT has a graph of this. And for audio listeners, I'm like, you know, separating my hands quite wide to, to show the discrepancy between the the two lines. But I, I think that we just need to think about stock ownership on a, on a big level. How do we get people in the equity markets? Because that's essentially a reflection of where you think the United States is going to go, the US stock market. And it has been an incredible wealth building opportunity. I think like it, there's a metric out there that it's like 10 or 20 times more value is generated from the stock market portfolio than a house portfolio. And I also think like baby bonds, like how do we, you know, set up babies to succeed in the U.S. is a great thing to think about. And I think, yeah, like business ownership, employee stock option programs, which I get a little bit of pushback on that because people don't want to divvy up their business, which makes sense. But I really just think it's it's time for a conversation about, you know, what should housing be? And that's a really tough conversation to have. And I have not had it successfully okay. <laughs> yet because Nobody wants to talk about that. So one more question on this. We'll move on. So baby bonds or baby like ETFs for the S&P 500? <laughs> yes. I mean, wh- how would you proceed? Equity or, or debt? Oh, I think it makes it both, yeah. Okay, like, it makes it both. Yeah, a baby. Portfolio. <laughs> a diversified baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So going from diversified baby portfolios to other issues – related to babies, and that's population growth. Mm. So that's something that really concerns me. I'm someone who's pro-population growth. I see all these challenges. I know there's degrowthers out there. But to me, you know, labor force, idea generation, those things are important, long-term economic growth. And yet we're having a decline in fertility, decline in family formation. And we're also, it looks like, pushing back against even legal immigration. Is there interest in this? Is there, you know, as you reach out to your, your followers... The younger generation, do they care about these issues? Yeah. Oh, they're, they're concerned too? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that like there's demographic divide, number one. So people are just staying in their jobs quite a long time. And so that creates a lack of mobility, I think, for younger people. And so that's an element of frustration where I think the life path doesn't move as fast as it used to because people are just living longer. But I think a lot of people might want to start a family, but the cost of child care is prohibitive. And then housing is also... Back to housing. It's (laughs) always back to housing. I I get criticized for this sometimes, but I think it's true. Like, you know, boomers own more three and four family bedrooms than the millennials do. And that's probably Mm. something that should have passed on at this point, but there's tax incentives for the boomers to stay in their homes. And why why would they sell? You know, they're sitting on a golden right, egg. Right. And so I, I think that a lot of people are concerned about demographics because we are facing essentially a cliff with Social Security. You know, Medicare is extremely expensive and it doesn't seem like there's an investment towards the future sometimes. Right. Like, you know, when you look at how like public education is sometimes treated. A lot of schools are underfunded. So I think a lot of people look around and they're like, maybe this isn't the best environment to raise a kid in. So like, there's the economic cost of having a child. But then you also do see family formation happening much later. Like People are having babies later. They're getting married later. I don't really know why that's happening. I have speculations, but I don't have mm-hmm. hard data. I just think people are taking time to make these decisions and staying in school longer or just sure. taking a longer time. But the opportunity cost of having a family is definitely higher yeah. because of all these reasons you, you've yeah, exactly. outlined. So one last question on on the Generation Z or the, the folks that follow you. I know it's wider than Generation Z, but I am curious. Do they care about the issues we care about. So we, we'd like to talk about monetary policy. Who's we? Two of us. Here. Okay, yeah. People in this world. So, you know, you mentioned my podcast. It reaches a niche audience. I mean, I'm honest. I, I acknowledge this. You know, like my, my daughter, for example, she's a high school student, and she tries to explain to her friends what I do, and it's very hard, Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And even she has a hard time understanding everything I say on this show. Does the Gen Z have an interest in monetary policy? Do they have an interest in fiscal policy and, and you know questions like that? When, when you do your videos, do you get the engagement on those topics? 
Yeah, I think a lot of people are very fascinated by monetary policy, but it is complicated. And so that's what yeah. I try to do is like really distill it down to the bare forms. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. The way that I have thought about it recently is that like everybody kind of likes knowing that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And so that requires like a baseline knowledge of mm-hmm. biology. And that's all people kind of want sometimes is like baseline knowledge. So they want the baseline knowledge of how interest rates are going to impact them, what it means when Jerome Powell comes out and talks. And apparently he's getting recognized at restaurants now. So people are that. paying attention. Yes. And he can't go out anymore, which is kind of sad. But Yeah, people want to know. They want to know about the policies that are being passed to help them. Mm. But it's foundational because, like, you do have to be kind of a super geek to listen to some stuff, like, you know, the depths. Like macro musings. (laughs) (laughs) The depths of monetary policy. And that's okay. Like, that's where, you know, comparative advantage comes in. (laughs) But I would say a lot of people really, they want to know what's happening around them, for sure. So do you think the, like, the inflation surge you know, fostered more interest in some of these questions? Yeah. Okay. Like things were kind of boringish, you know, up in the 2010s. You know, the 2018 debacle was quite interesting from a monetary policy perspective when the Fed had to respond to the treasury market. But like things were kind of boring, I think. The stock market didn't move a whole lot. Things were just sort of tepid. And you're crushing me here, Kyle, because <laughs> I thought it was very interesting in the 2010s. I mean, but looking, uh, yeah. but looking um, back, you're right. Compared to what well, we went through, yeah. it's it all was, relative. Yeah. So, I mean, back then we were fighting over makeup policy. Oh, we're 40 basis points below inflation <laughs> target. Woe is us. The world's coming down. <laughs> well, and, you know, post-Great Recession. Yeah. I was like not old enough to absorb right. that. And so I'm speaking with bias, of course. But yeah, I think now recently there's social media. People are seeing things on TikTok, which are okay. just total lies, like BlackRock runs the world, et cetera. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I think people just want to know what's true and they want to know the data sources. Okay. They want to understand. So, yeah. Well, that's interesting to hear that when I started this podcast it was in 2016, and it was really interesting, a number of millennials were coming on the show and they kind of cut their teeth on the Great Recession. For them, that was very formative. Some of them were journalists, some were economists, and and that really pushed them forward. So it's interesting to hear your perspective as you come on. Do you think the pandemic is the kind of definitive experience for Gen Z? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, because I was 10 during the Great Recession, and then I was 21 during the pandemic, or 20. So that was extremely formative, right? Like being a young adult. And then... It was real. Yeah, for everybody. You were sort of stuck inside. And I didn't have a corporate experience, really. And all I know as an adult is inflation. And I think that's a lot of people. And so that totally shapes how you think about the economy. Yeah. Yeah. One last topic from your book before we close... And again, your book's title is In This Economy, How Money and Markets Really Work. You you really love data. I can see you really getting into data. You had several majors dealing with data. And and that is like labor market indicators. And and what should we look to when we think about labor market indicators? There's so many of them. And the Fed, you know, it seems to pick the one that fits its narrative depending on where we are in the cycle. So so how should we think about it? What, what is your suggestion to yeah. us? Well, actually, I, I had the chance to interview Jared Bernstein today of the Council of Economic Advisors, and I asked him this basically the same question because I was like, you know, Jolts really doesn't do a great job at telling yeah. us what's going on. The quits rate tells probably a better story, but like how should we think about the data sources? And I think his answer is very good, which is like you have to look at the tapestry of data. It's a mosaic. Like you have to look at job openings relative to quits, relative to wage growth, et cetera. And so I think that's like the thing with the labor market is you have to take all of these things into consideration. Luckily, wage growth is, you know, still trending upwards, but job openings are funky. They're weird to measure. The quits rate is normalizing. We're seeing a cooling labor market. And the only way that you could come to that conclusion is by taking all of the different metrics into account. That's what he said about data. And I think that's probably the best bet. Yeah. So cast a wide net, look at at a dashboard of indicators. Absolutely. All right. One more thing on labor markets. And my former boss here, William Beach, he was a commissioner at the BLS, I believe, under Trump. But he was someone I reported to before he left Mercatus. And he recently had a, a tweet, which was pretty surprising, received a lot of attention, surprising for him. 
But he, he put this. He said, the BLS has taken a lot of heat for announcing that the CPS sample size will be reduced due to budgetary constraints. As the immediate past commissioner at BLS, I'm here to tell you that the BLS is not playing politics and that we are indeed losing the CPS because of poor funding and slow modernization. Congress can help fix CPS by demanding change and funding better a better survey. And he goes on several more paragraphs. But that's my former boss from Mercatus Center saying we need more government funding for this survey. Agree? I asked Jared Bernstein about this as well because I was like, what the heck? Uh, yeah. You know, like data is sort of the bread and butter of how we understand this stuff. And like how can funding be cut, especially when it, maybe the data it's not that comprehensive in the first place. Right. And so he said that it's something that they're working on, something that they're thinking about. It's like, how do you get more funding to these data sources? And I was actually at the National Association of Business Economics and the whole entire conference was about economic metrics uh, and mm. data. It was a data conference. And so like the BLS was there, the BEA was there, the census was there, several private sector companies were there. And there's a lot of attention being paid to data and how do we fund it properly? You know, how do you think about private sector data like Zillow and Redfin apartment data relative to like the housing data that is collected via CPI and via the BLS? So I, I think a lot of people are thinking about it. But uh, yeah, I think data is one of the most important things to have funding for, because if we don't understand data, we don't understand the economy. And we can't have the right debates. Yeah, so. <laughs> seriously. Okay, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Kyla Scanlon. Kyla, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings. <laughs>